Right, good morning. I think it's morning anyway. Uh, it's the seventh of what is it May? It's uh, May 2013. Yes, I've got that right. And we're back in Edinburgh again. Uh, I haven't got a tie on this morning. We're very casual. Uh, for uh, Piper's persuasion, and why we're not wearing a tie because we're going to be doing some office work. We're looking at records, very famous records, of John McClellan, late of Edinburgh Castle. And uh, we'll expand on that uh, wee story as we go. And with us, of course, we've got famous uh, son, Colin McClellan, who previously interviewed by Piper's Persuasion. And if you haven't seen that, then you should have by this time. <laughs> uh, that's you get the wee round. So, anyway, uh, see Colin McClellan's previous one, and this is a sequel where we are going into the records of John McClellan and his life, really. Uh, and uh, we're going to kick off very shortly showing uh, memorabilia which is, is woefully scattered about this room. Uh, and we begin with a uh, history of uh, John's father. Yes. What's my his name? Grandfather William. William, okay. So we're just going to wander about with the camera here. You'll need to put up with a wee bit of lack of focus, a wee bit disjointed, but it's the story we're really after. And we hope to give you a thorough background history on uh, piping in Edinburgh as seen through the eyes of John McClellan. In the background, incidentally, folks, we've got the famous Barry Ewing doing his cameraman. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, don't blame me, blame Barry. Uh, you <laughs> folk in North America who can't see and you can't hear and all that sort of stuff. Right, anyway, moving on. Right, Colin. Uh, could you kick off uh, this morning and tell us what you've got here? I understand this your grandfather's uh, memorabilia, is that right? Yes, um, my grandfather was William McClellan uh -huh. and they were from uh, the northwest of Scotland, Achnasheen, Achnashell, that area. Uh -huh. And uh, I knew my grandfather quite well, but my grandmother died when I was about uh, Oh, I suppose maybe seven years old. So I, I remember her quite well, but not uh, not not as well as my grandfather. And of course, my grandfather taught my father to, to play the pipes. So just a couple of. What did your grandfather get his piping? Well, you know, my grandfather was was uh, a piper in the HLI. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't actually know where he where he was where he got his, his start in, in, in piping. He was, a, he was a good enough player, but he wasn't a, an outstanding player. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got a, just a couple of things. Yeah. Uh, this is what I have of, of, my, of my grandparents. Right, it's not very much. much. Well, I want to start with this little... This is a shot glass. But my grandfather fought in the Battle of the Somme, and he carried this shot glass with him at all times. Mm -hmm. So this little thing has been has been through quite a bit and it's a very sort of plain and quite an elegant thing it's it's it's, it's one of the possessions that i have that are, that are very important to me yes, yes you know so that's that's that that. the battle of the psalm we had that the yeah. battle of the psalm mm -hmm. uh and also he had a a little gold pocket watch of course which was quite traditional at the, at the time sure that, was you know? the oh, that was my grandfather's pocket watch Mm -hmm. And then I came across, uh, a while ago, a couple of things that I found really very interesting. Uh, this was my grandmother's mm -hmm. sort of security pass. It says local pass defense of the realm. Mm -hmm. and folk, it's an ID thing during the, the First World War, mm -hmm. uh, which is pretty interesting. And then I found... With that, I found uh, from the year 1918 uh, ration coupons. Well, ration coupons from, eh? from the First World War. You all heard of ration coupons, Second World War. We had the First World War as well. I don't so think. I don't think things so could have been. What's that for? Mince and cheese and stuff. Well, it says sugar, uh, fats, fats, butcher, butcher meat, meat, bacon, and, bacon and, a, and a blank one. Ah. 
Things could be for a whiskey. That, that wee one at the bottom. Eh? It's, oh. it's, it's remarkable that these five weren't used. So uh, there uh -huh. we go. And then just finally, ah, uh, my my grandfather was. Uh, worked on the railways for a short period of time. My father was born in Dunfermline in 1921. When they were down there, he was working on the railway. And then they moved back up to the to the uh, Akneshin area and settled on a place called the Glen Morriston Estate mm -hmm. in the Great Glen, mm -hmm. where my father went to school. And these, these pictures are just, uh, that's my grandfather actually playing the pipes. Mm -hmm. Uh, and a photograph of my grandfather and grandmother. Mm -hmm. Get it. And yeah, anyway, this is my father's brother Roderick. Roddy, we called him. And he was my father's younger brother. And unfortunately, he contracted polio, and he was lame his whole life. And uh, my father also had another younger brother, William, who actually only passed on about two years ago. Mm -hmm. And they all attended Fort Augustus Abbey School in Fort Augustus and they had to go from the estate to the bus stop and they actually carried Roddy in a wheelbarrow to the, to the bus stop uh, uh, and then got the bus to the school and it was uh -huh. the same routine going home. And that's a picture of, of of William, uh, who became a detective in the police in Sunderland. He lived all his life in, in England. So that's what I have of uh, the background of my father's family. Right. Of course, when they were growing up in Fort Augustus, uh, my father came to about the age of 14. And uh, when he was 15, he joined the uh, Queensland Cameron Highlanders as a boy piper, but before that he actually left school and he he helped, he assisted my grandfather in the grounds of the Fort Augustus Abbey School as a gardener. Mm -hmm. And uh, these are quite interesting because it, it contains some of the early educational certificates from from his schooling, mm -hmm. as it were, and having left school at quite an early age. I heard them talk quite a lot about Miss Bowie Mm -hmm. the head teacher. That's, his, that's his last school certificate. John Archibald McClellan, Fort Augustus, Roman Catholic School, advanced third year class, and it's his first place in class. Uh -huh. So that's quite so, nice. Uh, that, and we'll have that scanned in. Mm -hmm. And that's just another day school certificate. Mm -hmm. These are the early army ones. This one is <coughs> dated. I think it starts, uh, this one here, 1937, so mm -hmm. they'd have been 16. Of course, when they went to the army as boy soldiers, they were they were given classes and, and education as well as piping, of course. Uh -huh. So it moves up from third class to second class to, to first class subsequently. Yeah, so English, maths, current affairs, geography, Applied map reading. So I was an a requisite for a worldwide paper. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's a bit of background into when he when he went and joined the army yeah. uh, as a boy soldier, and later on, of course, uh, he met my mother, uh, Christine McClellan, and they met on the grounds of Angus McPherson's hotel on the banks of the River Shin. Mm -hmm. And the background behind that is that my father had, by this time, he'd been appointed pipe major of the Sea Force at the age of 19. And uh, the band was there playing at a garden fete, and my mother sold them a raffle ticket. Mm -hmm. was, how they, was how they met. So that's quite interesting. Did so, he win? Uh, no, well, I think he did. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it won um, away, but yes. not the actual <laughs> raffle then. <laughs> so there's my. my uh, Parents' wedding photograph mm -hmm. uh, in Inverness, and this gentleman who was the best man—I uh -huh. uh, think his name was Donald Stewart. 
Uh -huh. uh, I was at the Northern Meeting a couple of years ago and a lady in the audience behind me tapped my shoulder and said, uh, the best man at your father's wedding, I know him and he's, he's still alive and, and, and right, well in Inverness. Right. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So I thought that was really quite interesting. Yes. Uh, other early things about, about my dad's career is I looked up in the Piping Times. Now upstairs uh, there's a whole set of Piping Times from, mm. from the very first edition to the last. And it's an absolute complete collection in that every single issue is original. I think it's perhaps the only one in the world that has every single original copy. There's other, I think there's other collections of maybe the odd photocopied one, including the one I believe that the College of Piping has. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a great reference and I was going through it and this is in the in the second year I think of the Python Times volume 2 uh -huh. and there's an article so this would be about 1948 or 49 there's a small article on my father's career thus far yes to about 1949 Ferris Piper's number 11 um, Major John A. McLeod and C. it mentions his achievements up to uh -huh. up to that time which was, which was quite interesting because he, he started to compete when he was about 25 years of age. It wasn't, it wasn't early and I think that was basically because of the, of the cessation of the war mm -hmm. at that time. And there was a whole crew of them ready to, when the war was on, had been beavering away and were ready to, and, and some of course had, had, had retired. So there was a whole new... Um, Can I take you by what to do during the war? He island. was he was down in in uh, Aldershaw. He wasn't involved in in, in, in any combat. He was sent. Uh, he spent most of the time in Aldershaw mm -hmm. in, in England with with the band. Uh, so he was he was uh, not actually involved in the in the in the war in a in a combat mm -hmm. capacity. Uh, so he started competing when he was twenty five, and I think on his. On the first visit to to Oban, he uh, he won the marches, I think it was, and, and a prize in the Suspiration Reel and the gold medal. Then he went to Inverness, and I think he won the marches and the Suspiration Reels. And then that was, I think, 1946. And then subsequently at at uh, Inverness, he won the former winners' march of Spain Reel in 47, 48, and 49. Mm -hmm. and this is the first four years of competing. So I mean, it was it was the kind of case where he, he sort of came on the scene very quickly and, and had a lot of success. Uh, so we might move over to his his rather impressive collection of of medals here. These, of course, are his army service medals. Uh, Remember the British Empire, various. Uh, so that's that's MBE yeah. and various others. Uh, yeah, there's a Malaya medal. There's service medals from from the army, and that's the, the miniatures, of course. Mm -hmm. I'll just put these up here for now. Mm -hmm. And if we just uh, several of these. Well, they're all very interesting. Uh, this, I believe, is the first sort of major prize. He mentions this one in an interview in the 1939 at the, I think it was the Battalion Games. Can you just turn it around? Right. Yeah. 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 I think it was the Battalion Games, won by 292-8895 Piper, J. McClellan, for March of Spaniel, 1939. So he'd have been 18 uh -huh. uh, when he got that one. Uh, the Cadball Medal. Mm -hmm. Championship medal. Uh, so that one's that was the start of it, and various medals. These ones are from Dornick Games. These are Dunvegan medals. Uh, two gold medals. He won the clasp at Inverness twice, but he only has one clasp because the first time he won it, he it was in the days where you could play in the class without having the gold medal. So he won, he'd already had the, the 
open one mm -hmm. so he could play in it, but they mm -hmm. didn't actually award the class if you didn't have the Inverness medal, which My he won the, the year after. Yeah. Uh, are these they, ones at the far end? Those are bronze stars from the from the former winners March of Spain Real in London. Ah. Uh, the Wrath of Gordon. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, one of the mysteries which I'll probably never find out about is the Silver Star from Owen Inverness. He won nine Silver Stars. He won five at Inverness and four at Oban. In this display cabinet, there's only five. <laughs> I'm not sure. He used to wear one in his kilt. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I really don't know what is going on You'll there. You'll be in the dark, deep recesses yeah. of this house somewhere. Yeah. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and then perhaps the most other, one of the most other interesting ones is this one here, mm -hmm. which is the Balvini medal. Yes. Of which she was very, Services to piping. Of which she was very proud because of course she was awarded this at the Glenfiddich Championship mm -hmm. uh, for overall services to Piping. To piping, mm -hmm. uh, which is very nice. I remember when when we were at the house in Ramsey Garden in, in the castle, he, uh, he he never displayed these medals until we moved into this house here, and it was very much at my mother's instance. He he was typical of uh, of of his generation, and, and I suppose any generation, he, he was not all that anxious to put them on display. Aye. But my mother quite rightly was. Absolutely. And, uh, Wonderful achievement. It certainly is, exactly. And exactly. that's why these medals are cast to be shown, not rather lying at the back of a drawer somewhere. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So, he, I mentioned earlier that he was Appointed Pipe Major of the Seaforth Highlanders at age 19. Managed to get a week's tuition from Pipe Major William Ross before he joined the army. Uh, Pipe Major Ross was on one of the weeks long courses that the, that the Peabury Society sponsored and paid him to do and he was in Fort Augustus for a week. And my father was able to get a week's tuition. That was the summer uh, tour, if you like. Exactly. Yeah. And then later on, he was sent uh, on a Distinguished Pipers course for a week with uh, William Ross at Edinburgh Castle before he was appointed Pipe Major. And then he was sent, after he was appointed Pipe Major, he was sent for a week's tuition uh, to Pipe Major John MacDonald in Vernas. And then uh, he was subsequently in 1946, he was put on to the actual pipe majors course, which was a bit funny because he actually had to, to he was already a pipe major. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, but he didn't want to miss out. They, they initially told him that, no, no, you can't do this. You're already a pipe major. There's no, but he said, well, I haven't had the, I haven't had the benefit of, of the tuition that, yes. uh, and, and so he talked them into allowing him to do the Pipe Majors course. He did that Pipe Majors course under William Ross with uh, Pipe Major Robert L. Kilgour, uh -huh. uh, was on that first course with him. And when I was growing up here in Edinburgh, uh, Bob Kilgour was here uh, in Edinburgh. He was a Pipe Major of the of the uh, Highland Piper Society here yeah. in Edinburgh and also of the Eagle Piper Society in Edinburgh. And he was a great influence over me, Bob Kogar, uh, a, a very intelligent man and, and he taught me a lot about piping, he taught me a lot about, about other things and, and Bob is still in Edinburgh and we see him quite a lot at the Scots Guards Club. Uh, and he's at a good age now, I suppose. Bob is about eighty-four or eighty-five mm. now, and, uh, and he's he's <coughs> he's uh, he's doing remarkably. He's a remarkable man. Uh, so he was on my dad's pipe major course, and that is in Edinburgh Castle. Exactly. And uh, if you want further details on the circumstances of Edinburgh Castle, look at Bruce Hitchens' interview, where we have. Uh, gone through various locations of the Pipe Majors courses and other army uh, courses 
and it shows you the Edinburgh Castle situation. Sorry to interrupt. Hmm. Uh, so anyway, this is his, when, when people were on the Pike Mages course, a very intensive course, uh, lots of learning, uh, uh, lots of peeber playing, and a, a big component of the course is the, the construction and maintenance of the course book, mm -hmm. uh, of which this is my father's. And it's a record of the tunes that they had to play uh, in their pass out parade. And it says there's all here the distinguished pass, uh, Pine Major J. McClellan, 2nd Battalion, Seaforth Islanders course, April 1946 to September 1946, the Army School of Piping. And an index of the 12 Peabricks he would have had to learn. The twelve or so marches to sprays and reels, mm. all written out. And here, of course, is the first P book, and you'll see that absolutely everything. So there's no be, abbreviations at all. Everything's <laughs> written out. In every front. grace note, every croon lure uh -huh. is written out. Too long in this condition. MacDonald of Kinloch, Moira's lament, lament for Mary McLeod, and so on. And. So all the P rooks in this is every single Krumla written out. It's quite remarkable. And then of course it doesn't stop there. Remarkably, you get on to the light music. Where is it? Here we go. And it's all written out as well. Aberkerne Hounders. Aberkerne Hounders. Very neatly in columns mm -hmm. the Pony Anne, yeah. Duke of Roxburgh, all the sort of standard uh, tunes at the time, and then the suspension reels. Mm -hmm. At the back, pretty Marion. <coughs> mm -hmm. I think if I was doing the, if I was doing the course, I'd make sure I didn't include any eight-part tunes <laughs> for obvious <laughs> reasons. <laughs> uh, so I mean, it's a remarkable book. Yeah. See, I'm mm -hmm. interested. To mm -hmm. See the, if you the Peabro, mm -hmm. uh, uh, lament for Mary McLeod, for instance. Mm -hmm. uh, I was interested. Uh, the, the cadences and everything, uh, foot style is, is written. I actually had a, a, a quick look at this Aye. yesterday mm -hmm. because yeah. I was curious myself because I was wondering is this the way that, that he kept playing it? Because he always taught me to play a high A uh -huh. instead of the high G, Aye. which yeah. is there, but it's a high G there. But apart from that, it is exactly That's the way. The Part of the yeah. and it's got high G right in there, right? He's got the high G here. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so very interesting. Aye. See when he was taught Peter uh, of these tunes uh, from Willie Ross. What was um, a school of piping? What was a slant? What uh, uh, where was Willie Ross coming from uh, in his uh, approach to Peter playing? Well, that's an interesting question, an interesting point, because uh, Willie Ross was, was somebody who obviously learned his piping. I believe Willie Ross was taught to play the pipes by his mother. Uh -huh. uh, and, of course, there's not a lot of recorded music of Willie Ross playing Peabrook. And I think, I'm very, very sure that he wasn't one of those guys that, that, that got it from one place. Okay. And so, of course, he went on to win eight class at Inverness. And it's a bit of a pity that there's no recorded music of him actually playing. Uh, indicative of his playing would be a through the through style some of his pupils yeah. uh, and pupils of those pupils. Uh, I think he. he uh, as I say, was was one of these kinds of people that, that, that put it together and, and got it from a wide, a wide variety of sources. Right. Uh, certainly, just, nobody sort of refers these days to the Willie Ross way of playing Peter mm -hmm. as they do to to are you are you Brown and Nickel, Nickel. And, 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 yes. and maybe Robert Reed or or those types who, who... What sort of impression do you have of... Uh, was it markedly different or was it along similar lines from Nickel and Brown? Well, I think do you have any it was very... Well, I think it was very direct. I think it uh -huh. was... I think it was... Uh, 
first and foremost, things had to have life and a, and a bit of go about them. Uh, I think it was very correct. Uh, it's very, very interesting referring to these kinds of documents and books and early tapes of my father playing and then later on where he learnt more as he, he often said as a lot of pipers do after you stop competing and you start to judge and you start to you and so maybe that should bring me on to to this uh, this book here which is he was an enormous collector of recorded music mm -hmm. and upstairs there's there's banks of cassette tapes mm -hmm. uh, and he kept them very, very organized, very, very organized. And this is what he called the John McClellan Cassette Index. Mm -hmm. And just to show you how he did this, it's really interesting. For instance, he's got, he's got here, let's take this, Lament for Donald Ban McCrimmon. And of course, he has all these numbers here. That is the number of cassette tapes he has of different people playing that tune. Oh, yeah. So he is that has. Right? Yes, he has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. He has eleven different recordings. The recordings of, of that tune. Somebody playing Donald Ban. Jeez. -o. So when I was lucky enough to come across when I was in Canada and 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 learn from him. He'd take me up to the attic room upstairs and he'd say, right, so you're learning such and such a tune for the competitions, uh, right, who do you want to hear playing it? <laughs> it was a sort of test, he was very proud of this, so I'd say, well, I don't know, let's hear Ian McFadden play it. Uh, and he'd go to this index and with great joy he'd go, right, uh, the massacre of Glencoe, Number 50, he'd go, Ian McFadden, let's listen to him. And so this was how, and, and he'd have all these recordings and we constantly refer to them all the time to, to, to find out different ways of playing tunes and to put it all together. What a wonderful in such a way. It is. And if we look, if we look further on, for instance, in the book, he'll have it also indexed by, by Piper. For instance, let's pick out somebody here. Uh, here's Murray Henderson, for example. Okay. So he's got Murray Henderson playing Catherine's Lament at the Park, Draw, Draw, Doll Do Mackay, etc., etc. So, and, and then if we, if we go somewhere else, uh, oh, there's me. Uh, <laughs> that's Angus MacDonald. Seems to have more of me than Angus MacDonald, which is quite good. Uh, <laughs> Here's himself, mm -hmm. John McDougall, mm -hmm. uh, Hugh, McCallum, Hugh McCallum, Andrew McNeil, and so on. Seamus McNeil, Don Ross, John McFadgen playing. So, I mean, it's, it's a remarkable collection of, of And that's various tops as well, and then a... Mm -hmm. And then playing playing the tunes. Yeah. Angus McPherson. Uh, that's valuable, mm -hmm. that, isn't it? It certainly is. Donald McLeod. Mm -hmm. This, this Look is... Look at Donald McLeod. Uh, well, I, I believe this is what has been released as... Uh, as later the, on as uh, well, discs of uh, Donald exactly. McLeod, yeah. Donald McPherson. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it was, it was a remarkable uh, experience being able to refer to all these. And you still have all these tapes, yes? Yes, I do. Uh, and how do you keep them there? Well, they're in they're in uh, two cabinets, mm -hmm. uh, slide drawers uh -huh. with all the with all the cassettes in them. And what I've done so far is we have a collection of Pirich by I've started and finished. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got him playing. It's quite a unique collection. I've got him playing. 167 different p rooks on the pipes from start to finish, uh, of which I hope to release in some sort of form. Uh, uh, I have to learn the technology myself, which is which is challenging. <laughs> Join the club <laughs> uh, to digitise all these things. Happily, the Army School under Stephen Small and Ian Duncan helped 
uh -huh. did a lot of the work and a few summers ago I had Cameron Drummond work here for for a summer and he digitized a bit. And it was quite remarkable because the army school were digitizing and Cameron were digita was digitizing at the same time and they didn't know that they were both doing it at the ah, same time. Yes. So, uh -huh. but there was overlap, uh -huh. which was valuable. And what I've done is I've, I've started this cassette here would be the first one. This is uh, Peabrick Volume 1. Mm -hmm. A uh, little bit about my father in the back, of course, and then on the inside, the, the tunes. And this volume one has Mary's Praise, Black Donald's March, Flame of Wrath, Abercrombie Salute, and the Laird of Kintullock Salute. So, did you have any particular reason for the choice of these tunes? Yes, I did. What, what I thought about when I put this together, there will be 30 different volumes of mm -hmm. this, mm -hmm. of this which, which will complete 167 tunes. And what I thought I would do, I categorized all the tunes into, I forget how I did it, mm -hmm. one category was the great tunes, the big ones, the Increase of Morags, the Children, all the rest. So there'll be one of that type of tune on each cassette. Then there was I thought the good medium sized tunes like the McSwan Aurora, the yeah. Don Duo and Kai that time, so there'll be one of those. Then there was good small tunes, uh -huh. the little spree, coriness and that kind of thing. And then there was an obscure category. Okay. And uh -huh. uh, a small the tunes without the crooners, all that kind of thing. So there'll be so there'll be five or six tunes on each but, uh, so there's something there for everybody in each disc, if you like. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, and I hope to to release also on digital sound files through through the web website or, mm -hmm. or this type of thing. And uh, as I say, I'll have to uh, just learn a little bit more about the technology of being being able to to do that. But uh, it's been a lot of work so far, but it's also been great because I've got once more to listen to all these things. And very interesting, most of the recordings were made in the early 1960s. And, you know, you can tell from the age, they're all done in reel-to-reels on, on the big Grundig machine. Yes, I, I. And we were quite lucky <coughs> because it, about, the middle, it would have been about the, just after my father died, he died in 1991, about five years after that, the School of Scottish Studies in Edinburgh here, Edinburgh University, sent two students who actually took these reel-to-reels and put them all onto cassettes, Okay. which was the technology at the time. Right. And that was a massive job. Uh -huh. And then Cameron and the Army School took the cassettes. I think the Army School did it directly from the reel, the reels, but Cameron took the cassettes and, and spent a lot of time cleaning them up and, 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 and making them the best they could be uh -huh. uh, and put them into digital sound files. Now, when my father made all these, all these uh, recordings, he made them for teaching purposes yes. only. They're not performance tapes. <coughs> uh, most of them are, are, in terms of the quality of the recording, remarkably good. And, but some of them have got little damaged bits where the actual oxidi oxidization on the, oh, on the, the tape, tape causes yes. little blips. blips and this yeah. Type of, yeah. Pretty minor stuff, uh, really. Uh, but most of them are, and there's several, a lot of the recordings are absolutely outstanding uh, renditions. So it's all very interesting. and. The other, very recently, one of the things that I always regretted a little up until this point is, is uh, there doesn't seem to be any recordings of my dad playing light music at his, at his best, at his peak in those, mm -hmm. in those years. And I came across a cassette tape uh, quite recently of him playing lots of Big March of Suspense in 1960. There's quite a few tunes on it. Yes, there is. Mm -hmm. there's, there's, there's possibly something like 
six or seven marches, six or seven suspects and things like that. And it was made in Germany uh -huh. in 1960. Uh, and I've made a sound file of, of, of those and, and, and uh, we can pretty good really. that. Yes. Yes. All right. Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so who have we here? These are some pictures that I picked out that uh, I thought would be interesting. I might run through some of them. This is at, at, a, at a Highland Games. I'm not sure if it's identified. Dornach Games in 1955. Mm -hmm. And this is Plate Major Bob Hill. Mm -hmm. This is John D. Burgess. This is my father. And this is Plate Major Donald McLean of Lewis. Mm -hmm. My father wasn't competing in 1955. It was, he must have been on leave from overseas, hence the, the trousers and the yep. jacket. Yep, yep, uh, yep. Which is a very unusual photograph of him in these days because when we were growing up, he, he wore the kilt 100% uh, of the constantly. time. Constantly, yep. I mm -hmm. remember him being underneath the car fixing it with, with the kilt <laughs> on. Uh, <laughs> so that's an interesting one. Yeah. I'll just run through these quickly. This is him in Chicago in possibly the early 60s, he was presented with a Stetson hat, which he's looking a bit, a little bit amused at. Mm -hmm. I remember that Stetson hat mm -hmm. coming home. Yeah. My sister and I loved that hat. <laughs> Great. Uh, Great. These are a little bit older. This is him when he joined, uh, as a piper, boy piper. What feather is that now? That's the eagle feather. Mm -hmm. Uh, Cameron Highlanders. Okay. Hmm? This one here is his, in 1959, the first course, the first Pipe Majors course that he, he took after he, he was appointed to the castle. Uh, it was in 1959 and this is Pipe Major Angus McDonald Scots Guards. Uh, this is, now it's two or three of these I don't actually know, but this is Joe Wilson. Correct, the Gordon Highlanders. Mm -hmm. This is John Allen, uh -huh. Scots Guards at the time, who later of course became director of Army Bagpipe Music. Uh, I think this is Sergeant Halley, the Irish Guards. And of course this is my father. Unfortunately, the other two gentlemen, I'm, I'm not sure, you might know Alan. Mm -hmm. Like just draw mm -hmm. the, uh, the uh, mm -hmm. I don't know who that yeah. chap is there or there, yeah. but no doubt we'll get emails in the future mm -hmm. yeah. uh, <laughs> describing who they of are. Of and I, I think actually Bruce Hitchens showed me a similar photograph in his interview, and he probably did identify him. So if you're that interested, folk, go back to that segment. The interesting thing about about. Mm -hmm. His appointment in 1959 to the yeah. castle was, was at that point he was almost going to come out of the army mm -hmm. and he'd been lined up to take a harbour master's post in Belgium. Harbour master? In Belgium, believe it or not. Well, there you go. Eh? And uh, the <laughs> school, because Willie Ross had retired some years earlier and I think the school had virtually become dormant it was decided to resurrect and appoint a uh, chief instructor and my father was appointed to that which which changed things for us. Yeah, at the time he was up in Dingwall. Mm -hmm. He was in Dingwall for two years which is where I was born. I was born in 1958 and we moved to Edinburgh for him to take up the castle appointment in 1959. My oldest sister Christine, she's two years older than myself, she was born in Gibraltar. Uh, when they were posted over there, that was in 1956. So things could have been very different for us if, if, uh, if the school hadn't been decided, to, uh, had not been decided to resurrect the, the army school. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, right, who have we got there? This photograph here is at an unidentified Highland Games, which would be quite interesting. Uh, my father and Jimmy Young, uh -huh. uh, who was a tremendous player, 
and I know from, from listening to my father talk about Jimmy Young, he had a great admiration for Jimmy Young's playing. He always had a wonderful bagpipe, mm -hmm. Jimmy. Wonderful bagpipe. Yeah. Jimmy was a piper in the Edinburgh Police mm -hmm. for a short period of time. Yeah. So that's, at, that's at the games, unidentified Highland Games. Uh, this photograph here is taken in front, of course, of Edinburgh Castle, and that's the photograph that appears on one of his music books. I think it's more music for the for the Highland Bagpipe. Okay, wonderful photograph. Hmm? Yeah. Then we've got this photograph here is of him with the famous violin maestro Yehudi Menuhin, mm. who visited our house in about 1963. Uh, during the Edinburgh Festival, Yehudi Menyon was interested in finding out the connection of uh, Peabrook and the bagpipe and the, and the fiddle and the violin. And he came to our house uh, and I remember my sister and I were sort of ushered in and, and met him. Uh, it, was a, it, was a great, uh, it was a great event uh, and that's them studying. One of my dad's puber books. Oh. This next photograph is at Buckingham Palace when my father was awarded the member of the British Empire mm -hmm. in 1963. And I remember this. This is us, my sister Christine, uh -huh. school uniform. Okay. And myself in the kilt. I was five and my sister would have been seven. That was a grand occasion where he he was awarded the MBE. And you showed uh, a certificate, which uh, is an MBE certificate there, isn't it? Yes. Uh, just a wee quick scan for the people. This is the, the official parchment that's given with it, signed by the Queen. Excellent. And Philip. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was that, that was a grand occasion. I remember that, I remember being in Buckingham Palace and uh, it's, a, it's a great memory. This is an even better memory for me <laughs> because this is the day I won the gold medal at Inverness uh, in 1982. And of course this the, is my- The tune was? The tune was uh, the Lament for the Viker of Dundee. Mm -hmm. uh, Wow, it's quite proud there. Well, the funny thing about this photograph, it is quite funny, is after, I think it appeared in the Press and Journal in Inverness, uh -huh. and I said to him, sort of half joking, I said, why, why did you have that piece of paper stuck, uh -huh. in, stuck in front of my pipes? Aye. And he said, and he was quite serious about this, he says, I didn't want anybody to see all that tape on your chanter. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, good. He thought of everything, eh? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Certainly did. Aye, uh, tape wasn't a big thing then, eh? Well, it was. Uh, it uh, was. Uh, and now everybody's got tape and just everybody, uh, every hole yeah. just is the, there as a standby, if the, not actually well, I think using it's, it. I think it's an indication of, of, of the improvement in, it, in the instrument. Yeah. I think, I think it's. Uh, uh, as it gets better and more finely tuned, the, the, the tape is... is yeah, we're just necessary. looking for a, a, a greater accuracy. Very, very fine tuning. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now, this last picture I have is, is of my father in the army school. Uh, just after he'd composed the Phantom Piper of Koryarik. Uh, and that's the score of it on the blackboard. The story of which we have on David Murray's interview. Indeed. That's right, that's um, right. I had the hair coming up the back of my head with that. That's story. right, that's right. But the father subsequently composed this uh, paper and he uh, is in front of a blackboard uh, here. That's right. Uh, it's, what pipes is that explained? That is his own bagpipe, the uh, Gavin McDougall of Aberfeldy that he played his entire piping. Career. And we, I think we've got them lying here, haven't we? That's right. I'll well, bring you. Me photograph. I'll bring you over to them. Yeah. Uh, 
The bagpipe is about, I believe now it will be about 120 years old. He, uh, he used those pipes his entire piping career. He gave me... There was a plaque there. There is a plaque there. Uh, he gave me the bagpipe in 1981. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. And the plaque simply reads some of the major prizes that he won oh, and yes. uh, some of the, the offerings I managed on it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so it's, now, it's about the bagpipe rather than the person, that's the, right. the deeds that have been that's right. done on the, and the instrument. Yeah. My wife Jenny is now the owner of the bagpipe okay. and uh, is playing it to great effect. So, is this a, the what kind of the, the bagpipe is cocos wood. Yeah, it's cocos wood mm -hmm. and sea ivory. Sea ivory. So at the time, it wouldn't have been one of the McDougal's very expensive sets because they're not actual sterling silver; they're German silver. Okay. Uh huh. Uh, and as I say, cocos wood. Very famous set. Uh -huh. uh, I remember when he gave me the, the bagpipe, it was at a recital in Canada, and he, he was playing in Kingston, Ontario, and at the end of the recital, he played the McGregor's Gathering on the, on the bagpipe, and it was outside, the recital was outside on a warm summer's night, and there was a large, large audience there, maybe 150 people, and at the end of the recital, he called me up on the on the stage and said it was now time to, uh, to, to have the bagpipe. And I was just astonished. I mean, I didn't, uh, at the time I had a perfectly good bagpipe. And uh, <laughs> I wasn't expecting this at all. Uh -huh. And the funny thing was, when I, when I saw him later on that evening, he said, well, you know, he, says, he said something to me that's kind of haunted me ever since. He said, well, you've got the bagpipe now, and good luck. Just remember, he says, that bagpipe is not so much as wavered on me. And it was quite funny because the next day I, I went to, there was Highland Games on in Montreal. Uh -huh. And Ed and I was judging. And it was a Dirac event and the pipes went roaring out of tune. And all the time I was playing, I, was, you know, I could think of nothing but this statement that they hardly wavered on him. Now, this last picture I have is, is of my father in the army school uh, just after he'd composed the Phantom Piper of Coriaric. Uh, that's the score of it on the blackboard. The story of which we have on David Murray's interview. Indeed, that's uh, right, that's um, right. I had the hair coming up the back of my head with that that's story. That's right, that's right. But the father subsequently composed this uh, paper and he uh, is in front of a blackboard uh, here. That's right. Uh, it's what pipes is that explain? That is his own bagpipe, the uh, Gavin McDougall of Aberfeldy that he played his entire piping career. And he, I think we've got them lying here, haven't we? That's right. I'll well, bring you, me a photograph. I'll bring you over to them. Yeah. Uh, the bagpipe is about I believe now it will be about 120 years old. He uh, he used those pipes his entire piping career. He gave me... There was a plaque there. There is a plaque there. Uh, he gave me the bagpipe in 1981. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And the plaque simply reads some of the major prizes that he won ah, and yes. uh, some of the, the offerings I managed on it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so it's, now, it's about the bagpipe rather than the person, that's the, right. the deeds that have been that's right. done on the, the instrument. Yeah. My wife Jenny is now the owner of the bagpipe okay. and uh, is playing it to great effect. So is this uh, the... What kind of the the bagpipe is cocos wood. Yeah. It's cocos wood mm -hmm. and sea ivory. 
see over. So at the time, it wouldn't have been one of the McDougal's very expensive sets because they're not actual sterling silver, they're German silver. Okay. Uh -huh. uh, and as I say, Cocos wood, uh, very famous set. Uh -huh. uh, I remember when he gave me the, the bagpipe, it was at a recital in Canada and he, he was playing in Kingston, Ontario and at the end of the recital, he played the McGregor's Gathering on the, on the bagpipe and it was outside, the recital was outside on a warm summer's night and there was a large, large audience there, maybe 150 people and at the end of the recital, he called me up on the, on the stage and said it was now time to, uh, to, to have the bagpipe and I was just astonished. I mean, I didn't, uh, at the time I had a perfectly good bagpipe. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I wasn't expecting this at all. Uh -huh. And the funny thing was, when I when I saw him later on that evening, he said, "Well, you know," he says, he said something to me that's kind of haunted me ever since. <laughs> he said, "Well, you've got the bagpipe now, and, and good luck and all that kind of stuff." And he said, "Now, just remember," he says, "that bagpipe has not so much as wavered on me." Ah. <laughs> <laughs> and it was quite funny because it was the next day I, I went to, there was Highland Games on at Montreal uh. and Ed and I was judging and it was the Peabrook event and the pipes went roaring out of tune and all the time I was playing I just, I could think of nothing but this statement that they hardly wavered on him. You know? Ah, but you had a, a reason for them wavering. He pinched the bass drone right out it, didn't he? He did. He, he, uh, what he did was he gave me the whole bagpipe, chanter, chanter read, tenor drone reads, except he wouldn't give me the bass drone reads, which he played for the time, I think in our earlier interview, it told the story, he played it for 12 years, the Aye. bass drone read. He didn't give me the bass drone read. So perhaps I can use that as an I, that, that was obvious. It wasn't your fault. It was a fire. In all, in all, in, in all seriousness, uh, the bagpipe I was playing before this one was a set of ivory David Glens. Uh -huh. And these Glens were terrifically steady and terrifically easy to, to, to read, etc. This bagpipe of my father's is not easy to to uh, maintain, but once once you've got it, it's, it's once you're into the way of it, it's really terrific. But yeah. So for the first for the first few weeks I had it, I find it quite difficult mm -hmm. to, to to get to terms with. It's just getting into the, the way of a new instrument, isn't it? And indeed, Jenny's had exactly the same experience uh, because the bagpipe that Jenny was playing before these, uh -huh. it's the same bagpipe that I was playing before these. Uh, so it's very interesting. And maybe at this point I can show you another bagpipe. Yes. Uh, and I'll tell you about it, mm -hmm. which is quite interesting as well. It's this bagpipe here. This is a an RG Laurie bagpipe. And I have to say it's probably the most magnificent set of bagpipes I've ever seen. And the story of these are when when dad gave me his pipes this is the set that he he started to play so he played these bagpipes from about 1981 to 1986 mm -hmm. was the last time he played them uh, and he bought this bagpipe from uh, pipe major Bert Barron in St Andrews yes who was uh, very much into the buying and trading in 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 rare bagpipes, rare Highland jewellery, medals, all that kind of thing. 1970 he bought them, they're about a 1936 lorry, ebony wood, and I think he bought them as a bit of a financial investment actually. And I remember when I was playing in the Amateur Club. Take it, that's full silver. That is full silver, yes. Uh, I remember they were in the house and when I started playing in the amateur competitions I I tried the bagpipe and I really liked the sound of them. Yeah. 
So I started to play them in the amateur competition, and I always remember my father saying, I don't know why you're playing that bagpipe, it's no, it's no good, you know, he says, it's, it's not as good, you're just wanting to play it because it looks fancy. And I said to him, no, no, these, these pipes are, are really good. And so, of course, when he gave me his bagpipe, and he, he, he was a bit stuck, I think. I don't know if he had a plan B after he gave me his. But he called me up in Canada and he says, you know, he says, all these years ago you told me that bagpipe was pretty good. He says, and, and I thought you were just playing it because they looked fancy. He says, you were right. He says, they are, they are really good. And I played these round the games uh -huh. quite a bit. Ah, but you had a, a reason for them wavering. He pinched the bass drone right out it, didn't he? He did. He, he, uh, what he did was he gave me the whole bagpipe. Chanter, chanter reed, tenor drone reeds. I accept he wouldn't give me the bass drone reeds, which he played for the time, I think, in our earlier interview. He told the story. He played it for 12 years. The Aye. Bass drone reed. He didn't give me the bass drone reed. So perhaps I can use that as The bagpipe I was playing before this one was a set of ivory David Glens. Uh -huh. And these Glens were terrifically steady and terrifically easy to, to, to read, etc. This bagpipe of my father's is not easy to, to uh, maintain, but once once you've got it, it's, it's once you're into the way of it, it's really terrific. But yeah. So for the first for the first few weeks I had it, I find it quite difficult mm -hmm. to, to to get to terms with. It's the, just going into the way of a right. new instrument, isn't it? And indeed, Jenny's had exactly the same experience uh, because the bagpipe that Jenny was playing before these uh -huh. was the same bagpipe that I was playing before these. Uh, so it's very interesting. And maybe at this point I can show you another bagpipe. Yes. Uh, and I'll tell you about it, mm -hmm. which is quite interesting as well. It's this bagpipe here. This is a an RG lorry bagpipe. And I have to say it's probably the most magnificent set of bagpipes I've ever seen. And the story of these are when, when Dad gave me his pipes, this is the set that he he started to play. So he played these bagpipes from about 1981 to 1986. Mm -hmm. was the last time he played them. Uh, and he bought this bagpipe from uh, Pipe Major Bert Barron in St Andrews. Yes. Who was uh, very much into the buying and trading in, in, in rare bagpipes, rare Highland jewellery, medals, all that kind of thing. 1970 he bought them, they're about a 1936 lorry, ebony wood, and I think he bought them as a bit of a financial investment actually. And I remember when I was playing in the amateur Take it, that's full silver. That is full silver, yes. Uh, I remember they were in the house and when I started playing in the amateur competitions I I tried the bagpipe and I really liked the sound of them. Yeah. So I started to play them in the amateur competition and I always remember my father saying, I don't know why you're playing that bagpipe, it's no it's no good. You know, he says it's, it's not as good. You're just wanting to play it because it looks fancy. And I said to him, No, no, these these pipes are, are really good. And so of course when he gave me his bagpipe and he, he, he was a bit stuck, I think. I don't know if he had a plan B after he gave me his. But he called me up in Canada and he says, you know, he says, all these years ago you told me that bagpipe was pretty good. He says, and, and I thought you were just playing it because they looked fancy. He says, you were right. He says, they are, they are really good. And I played these round the games uh -huh. quite a bit. As a lorry chanter. And you might as well tell us a story about a lorry chanter because we've been speaking about lorry bagpipes. Mm -hmm. Did, what instrument did uh, your father play that sound full uh, of the Pira on the lorry chanter? What, what bagpipes uh, was the uh, lorry chanter in? Well, the story behind that, Alan, was that in about, now when would the, would the time be, if we can move over to yeah, the table. absolutely. In about the late 70s, early 80s, my father 
uh, was asked by Arthur Laurie, mm -hmm. who was the managing director of R.G. Laurie, to come and help in the production of a of pipe chanter. The, the Laurie pipe chanters, it was fair to say in that era, were not very good. And my dad started going through to Glasgow a number of times per week. And Arthur Laurie had determined that if they were not able to produce a good pipe chanter, they would actually cease bagpipe making altogether. Mm -hmm. So my dad worked with Laurie's for a number of months and eventually they came up with this, with this chanter. And this chanter, in actual fact, was the, the same chanter that he played the last time he played in public which was in 1986 at the John McFadden Memorial Lecture in Stirling Castle. And he played two tunes that night. He played uh, the Lament for the Viker of Dundee, and then he played, he played the Lament for the Viker of Dundee, and preceding that he played Black Donald's March. Now, of course, he was a bit of a, very much a sound fanatic. And mm -hmm. he played two different chanters that night for the two different peevers. One being that he felt that one chanter, this one, had a slightly better high G and the other chanter he liked for the other tune. So when he Aye. played Black Donald's March, he played a single chanter and when he played the Lament for Vika at Dundee with the high G in it, he played this chanter, different reads. Uh, and he played it on that bagpipe that we've just been just talking about. Yeah, there. that's that's And so yeah. the sound file that that you're going to play along with this segment is the very last performance that he that he played on the pipes. Fantastic. Uh, so and this is the chanter. Uh, sad to say, the decision was made by Arthur Laurie to abandon bagpipe making completely, which I think is was a little bit premature because this chanter actually never saw the light of day and uh, as you can hear... It's a kind of one-off really, yeah. yeah. As you can hear on the, on it's the quite, tape... quite a decent sound off it. By well, as you'll hear on the, on the sound, it's, uh, uh, it's more than a decent sound. Uh, exactly. It's, 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 it's really quite a wonderful sound. So that's that's very interesting about that, that particular bagpipe mm -hmm. and uh, this chanter. Okay. And so that before going further, I would like to present a tune from my pre-war recollection. The scene is the Isle Ornsey Games in Sky. The date is August 1936. The judges are my father and John MacDonald. The weather is perfect. I am sitting on a hill overlooking the games ground in company with Frank Richardson. The competitor is John Wilson. The tune is the lament for the Viscount of Dundee. And to foster the illusion, here to play that tune is John McClellan, who in later years himself came to match the achievements of that famous four. to have a wee look at John McClellan's Peebrooks. Is that correct? 
That's right, Alan. He uh, he started composing Peebrook in the very early 1960s. Mm -hmm. And his first tune was a tune called The Salute to the Queen's Own Highlanders. And what I've gathered up are the original scores of most of the tunes that he that he composed. Mm -hmm. And it's really quite interesting because, you know, some of the instruction and the way that the actual tunes came out mm -hmm. is quite different. For instance, on this one, this was a tune that won a composing competition and it's called The Salute to the Great Pipe and he's got original manuscript. So you would think that this would constitute the finished product. In actual fact, it, what he came up with in the end and published was very much different. A totally different variation here. So it's uh, almost the first draft rather than the finished uh, yeah, tune. But it can get confusing because, as I say, when he's got original manuscript, you tend to sort of take that as being the, you know. So that's a salute to the great pipe. Mm -hmm. This is a welcome for Patrick Struan, who is my sister's uh, eldest son. Okay. Uh, this tune here is a draft copy of Patrick Struan. Farewell to the Queen's Ferry was composed for the opening of the Fourth Road Bridge in 1964. Uh, now this tune is a tune that he composed for the Highland Society of the, the the Piping Society of London for the Braddock Gorm and he's gotten it third draft 1985 but wished to revert to second draft so it all gets just a little bit confusing and there's the final copy of Ham Braddock Gorm and moving Has on ever played that tune there yes. in London? Uh, he played it in a recital, mm -hmm. and it's going to be played by Gordon Walker in the forthcoming uh, recital dinner okay. that we have to uh, for my dad's June. tunes on the 8th of June. Uh, this is another draft of the same tune. Mm -hmm. This is the first draft of his Salute to the Queen's on Highlanders, and the finished, finished copy of that. Mm -hmm. And so on. A salute to the succession of Lord Carnock as Chief of Clan Nicholson. That was commissioned by the, the Clan Nicholson. Mm -hmm. This is the original copy of the Salute to the Great Pipe. Roddy McLeod played this last year at the recital dinner. Salute to the Peeber Society. The Peeber Society commissioned him to write a salute to the to the Peeber Society in 1976, I think it was, or 78? 1978. 78. Uh, drafts of the Sloop Great Pipe again. Uh, you'll see in this one it became the Sloop to Queen's of Her name contained in sealed envelope attached, meaning that it was submitted for one of these composing competitions. Yes. The Edinburgh Peerer, which I, my opinion is that's his best tune. Uh, this is my effort. Uh, I composed one Peerer, which was lucky enough to win a, an international composing competition. Uh, he sort of taught me to do that, so I can credit him that's along excellent. with that. Yes. And this is a lullaby for Ian. This is my oldest son, Ian. Uh huh. Now Ian's thirty years old today. Oh it or not. my goodness! Happy, many happy returns uh, to Ian. It's hard to believe he's thirty. Mm -hmm. uh, but he wrote. Uh, Ian's my my parents' first grandson. So, and uh, uh, John composed that. Yeah, in in nineteen eighty four. He was born in eighty three. Terrific. So uh -huh. there we go. And so he 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 developed this extraordinary talent for for composing Peebrook. Uh and what we've done is we've instituted 
the John McLeod Memorial Trust has instituted the recital <laughs> dinner which takes place in the Royal Scots Club. There's one upcoming on June the 8th of which we have uh, Faye Henderson's going to play the Phantom Piper of Coryarrick. Uh, Stuart Liddell is going to play the Salute to the Queensland Highlanders. Gordon Walker is going to play um, Brat of Gorm. And Ian Spears is going to play a Salute to Patrick Struan. And I'll just show you the... the uh, if we go over here, we'll actually show you the, the medal that we have for the, for the winner. And it's a specially cast medal. Uh, Johnny McLeod and Captain Johnny McLeod Memorial Trust, and it's amazing these days what they can do. Yes, uh, this is the the exact image from the picture on the front of his book. One of the photographs we looked at. Great. Uh, uh -huh. is, is on the actual is on the actual medal. Mm -hmm. So it's a magnificent looking medal. The winner will get that, and this bronze one here. Uh -huh. is for uh, the Army School of Piping is holding a major premier and A-grade competition in October uh, called the Captain John A. McClellan Memorial Competition and the winner of the Peabrook will get this bronze medal uh -huh. uh, which, uh -huh. will be a, which will be an annual event yeah. for that. So it's a good way of, of uh, very appreciative of them for, for remembering my dad's work and uh, making sure that that you know these previous competition compositions are, are heard and, and distributed and and, uh, uh, and appreciated by by they seem to be very 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 well received when 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 they are heard. Right, we're having a look at uh, some of the music books, handbooks, what have you. Uh, uh, brought out by John. This music for the Highland Bagpipe was the was his first first book of music. Mm -hmm. uh, he included material on the phrasing of light music, mm -hmm. and he included material later on on the on the construction and makeup of of. In the different Fingers. secondary, tertiary, uh, etc. The construction of of Peabre, instructions for for phrasing, which was which is very interesting. Uh, light music book, uh, some of his own compositions, some from other people. The first tune is a tune called Alan Rowan of Port Appen, and the interesting thing about this tune was, uh, I think it was in the late nineteen forties. And they had a composing competition for marches and this tune here, I can't quite remember, was the recipient of either the first or the second prize but the remarkable thing about this composing competition is that the third prize was Pipe Major Don McLeod's The Knights with Cayley, ah. <laughs> which became, <laughs> which I have to say is a much better tune than this and became one of the the best march compositions probably of all time uh -huh. uh, so but that's what happens it's it's everything else in piping its opinion it's subjective uh, isn't it although this is a good and uh, nice tune i have to uh -huh. say i think uh -huh. they didn't get the result of that one quite right <laughs> oh well <laughs> uh, it's a very good tune and in this book he he uses a lot of the tunes ardenarf uh up near where he lived christine mcclellan my my Sister, uh, different tunes to commemorate different people. Yes. Mrs. Mrs. John McClellan. There's a lot of family stuff. Mrs. William yeah. McClellan, which is of course his mother. Uh, different things. There's a couple of interesting things later on. The Inveroy Sh Shinty Club. He was a Shinty player. Yeah. So he played okay. Shinty uh, in his young days. Mm -hmm. Young Willie Murray is my mother's brother. Uh, the Plains of Normandy, it was the first tune he ever composed in 1945, so he would have been about 24, and, and so on, different settings of different tunes. So that's okay. music for the Highland Bagpipe. And later on, in a, a different edition, he managed to add a couple of tunes to it, and he included all his Peaver compositions to, 
to that date. There's about ten, I think, in, mm -hmm. in this book. The ones that we've just looked at, the, yes. the original scores, and so on. He 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 added books, more music for the Highland Bagpipe. That's that photograph that. But it's on the medal. Yes, that's on the medal. Mm -hmm. uh, this is another edition of more music for the Highland Bagpipe. Different, right? Different cover. And this one actually is quite interesting because we'll take this album that we'll talk about later on. Mm -hmm. That's the picture. There you are. The same, the same picture. Mm -hmm. uh, Cal Bag, Agus Cal War. Mm -hmm. More light music, and in this one he's got uh, Phantom Piper of Coriac. There you are. Yeah, did that. Uh -huh. And he composed a useful, he constructed a useful book at the time, Bagpipe Music for Dancing. So people found this book very interesting and it gave them all the speeds, the, the instruction terrific, isn't it? for playing for country dancing, team dancing and, and highland dancing. Because of course in the army this was a, 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 a subject that they paid a lot of attention to. Uh, everybody learned to dance, of course. All the, the pipers and drummers, eh? All the good pipers, including my dad. He always used to say he much preferred to play for the dancing than actually <laughs> do the dancing. <laughs> so uh, that book was very successful. I think probably the most successful one was... Uh, it was a, a very, very successful... The Pipers, the pipers hand Handbook. Book, yes. A small booklet, large pamphlet, uh, with instructions uh, very handy in for the table case. form yeah. sort of identifying different so it's all we would call it troubleshooting yeah uh, with little tables and what to do instructions and tying in bags uh, and people found this when this book came out which was about the middle uh, 60s I don't think there was really anything There's no as a reference material the College of Piping came out a little bit later with a, with a maintenance book as well mm -hmm. now we're much better off there's several books that, that put out this notation and tuning of the Highland Bagpipe explaining in fairly simple terms the different pitch and this book contains a very very useful chart which shows you exactly what different sounds the tenor drones are making, what different sounds and frequencies the bass drones making, how it all matches up with the different notes on the chanter. This one demonstrates a bagpipe in perfect tune, and this one shows a sort of visual guide of one the if the drones uh, were, were exactly if the drones yeah. were in tune with one another but not with the low A and it, it, it really helps you visualize exactly what the problems are when 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 the bagpipe's not in tune so that was very That's interesting that, yeah and then he put out a, a tape on uh, Cantrick on the Netherlorn Cantrick with what he called a look and say guide mm -hmm. uh, which we we'll hope to get digitized and, and made available again. It's not available anymore, which is a very useful guide to he was very much into uh, into the whole educative process of, of piping. Uh, and a lot of his recitals uh, incorporated a talk. I came across a program the other day and I think he was playing in Seattle where where there was an actual program of what he was going to play, all the tunes were pre-picked, pre-arranged, and there was a talk in the middle of it on, I think, the Mackays of Rassi, something like that. And so he was very, very good at presenting these things, and because he was up at the castle running the school up there, he he took these things a stage further. Later on in, in the early 70s with the College of Piping and the Peabury Society, of course he was instrumental in starting the Institute of Piping mm -hmm. um, and that was the, that was the, the, the catalyst to, to having piping put on a more formal basis in terms of examination and they were instrumental in getting the piping into the schools in the Highlands as, first of all. Uh, and that led to what is now called the, the Piping and Drumming Qualifications Board 
and SQA, the Scottish Qualifications Authority, have now uh, validated that for for national qualifications. Uh, so it's and it provides a pathway of pipers into school teaching. Uh, by and they're, they're properly exactly. qualified, exactly, and they uh, they're appreciated by other teachers and other subjects rather than just a joke. Of course, of course, yeah. and, and of course, one thing's gone to another, and the National Python Centre, in conjunctions with the Royal Conservatoire, have the degree program, mm -hmm. and so piping is now on on a nationally qualified evaluation scale, uh, which can be no nothing but good for our for our art, our craft, mm -hmm. is recognised now as, as uh, equal with everything else. So he would have been very, very pleased if he could have seen how this whole, how that start of the Institute piping has, has, has developed and... And, 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 and it's burgeoning because of many, many youngsters taking part in all of this course, now. Of course, and, and it's a great thing because people can go and, and get national qualifications and, and right up to past past school now, they can get higher education qualifications in, in playing and learning the bagpipes, so that's got to be a, a very good thing. Monocle in the okay. story. Right, we have a monocle here, it's a wee story, uh, tell us all about it Colin. Well, it's, uh, I was at Inverary Games quite a few years ago and playing there and John Burgess was judging, mm -hmm. and during a break in the in the in the judging, being originally from, John was born in Aberdeen, spent his childhood in, in Edinburgh, and John was very very good to my sister and myself when we were growing up, and uh, because I was born in Dingwall, where John went up to John Hi. and Sheila lived in Dingwall for a while, and. and uh, they always referred to me as the boy from Dingwall. And anyway, he, so he sought me out at the Highland Games at Inverary and he said, you know, Colin, he said that you're, you know, it's not going to be too long before you're going to be judging, you know. And he said, you have to have the appropriate accoutrements, he said, you know, the, the case and the books, you have to do the references, but an essential piece of judging kit is the monocle, he said. And I sort of looked at him and, and said, oh, and he says, oh yes, he says, you know, he says, if there's, if there's a piper playing, he says, you wait until he's turned his back and you put in your monocle. <laughs> and he actually reached into his sporran and he took a ten pence piece and he put it in his eye. He says, and just when they turn around, he says, and, and if they get a wee bit nervous and they make a little tick, he called it a tick, a little mistake, if they make a little bit of tick, he says, so you just open your eyes and it'll fall to the ground <laughs> and they'll break down. Of course he said this completely in jest. Aye, aye. So after John John died very suddenly a short time after that and uh, I was working at the Edinburgh Academy uh, where John went to school and this very small box arrived. And I thought it was somebody sending reeds back to me or something. I had uh, a small box of reeds. It was about this size. Why did you send reeds back to you? That's terrible. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> uh, but I opened it thinking, oh, somebody sent me reeds back, the cheek of it, you know. And uh, I opened it carefully and in this was John's silver-mounted monocle from from Sheila with a little note saying to the boy from Dingwall uh, <laughs> because I know that you love that story. So it's I, it's one of my very great possessions and reminds me of that. Have you part. ever worn it in anger? No, I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> it just seems something I only right did it. About, about actually... No, the thing is, uh, there's some, uh, some really poor pipers up there like me, you know, <laughs> they, they could come uh, wanting, to, you'd like them to just leave the platform and that'd be a way of doing it, you know. I think that would be even taking the, 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 
the thing about waving the white hanky is aye. Much further. Aye. But anyway, as I say, in all seriousness, it was. It reminds me of that day aye. and the great memories of. of, of it was a good storyteller. And the great and the great playing of, of John yeah. Burgess. He was he was a, a person that I I looked up to a great deal. So I'm very happy to mm -hmm. have that. Uh, and the other thing that's quite interesting here is, is this collection of gold clasps from the Northern Meeting at Inverness. And these are gold clasps that were won by the very, very famous pipe major John MacDonald of Inverness. And there's five of them. John MacDonald won seven clasps in all. Uh, over a wide period of time, I think he won his last one when he was 66 years of age. Uh, the College of Piping in their museum has one clasp and one is missing. And these clasps I have quite simply because they were discovered in an antique shop in Bewley in, in the north of Scotland. And, uh, they came up for sale and because of my father's association with John MacDonald having been taught by him uh, and the piping history, I, 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 I was able to purchase them and so they're part of, of the collection of piping materials in, in this house and very, very important because John MacDonald not only being thought of as, as perhaps the greatest exponent of Peter and certainly one of the greatest teachers of Peabrook, uh, the tradition of the John MacDonald through uh, Pine Major Don McLeod and, and the Brown and Nicol and, and, and all the rest of the people, William MacDonald in Inverness. Uh, it's a great historical thing to, 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 to be able to preserve as a, as a set, those, those five clasps. Absolutely wonderful, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, now we're on the, the stairway of your, your house, outside the room where we've been working this morning and you have a collection on your walls here of various pictures and items of music. Uh, so, over to you Colin. When, uh, when I was going through my father's papers and, and, and books and manuscripts I came across a folder, a brown manila folder that was titled Manuscripts of World Famous Pipers. Okay. And in this folder of papers was these manuscripts which I've had framed and displayed. Uh, and I'll just take you through what each yep. one of them okay. actually are. This is the March Miss Jeannie Crothers by John McCall. And the very interesting thing about this is it's written out by George S. McLennan. Uh -huh. But the title on it here is not Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Miss Jeannie Carruthers, it's Dingle Doozy, of which I've not been able to find out what. Dingle Doozy is an old uh, poem, I believe. Uh -huh. uh, it's it's uh, Miss Jeannie Carruthers by John McCall. And I suppose in these days when, when they were composing these marches, of course they didn't have the facility that we have to just photocopy the tune, or they actually had to write it out. Aye. If, if it, this was before it would have been published in any book. Mm -hmm. So if, 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 if you wanted to play the tune, you would have to obtain some sort of copy. So that's uh, Miss Jeannie Carruthers. This is uh, Lock and Side written out by G.S. McLennan with, with Harmony and this one here is also a, a G.S. McLennan manuscript. Uh, this is a fragment of Peabrook which I believe may be some sort of tuning phrase mm -hmm. that he perhaps used. I don't know if you can see here, it's G.S.M. Uh, second month of 1913. Uh, this is a small uh, reel uh, moving on to this one, it's quite interesting. This is a six-parted march that I believe has not seen the light of day in a book, composed by G.S. McLennan and written out in his hand uh, in 1908. And it's a good tune, and on the back of it, there was a handwritten note to whoever he sent it to. 
and the handwritten note says, if you think it is worthwhile, I could perhaps give this a better shape, probably making it four decent parts instead of six, changing a note here and there. Better still, you might mark in any changes you suggest. And then he goes on to say, I will send you a cured reed tomorrow. It is not so good as the one I was boasting about, but it will let you see what I mean. This was an old flat drone reed, absolutely useless. Mm -hmm. GSM. So Amazing, I don't think yeah. we'll ever find out how he, who he wrote that to. This is an original manuscript of John McDougal Gillis, mm -hmm. The Red Speckled Bull. And up here, we've got the original manuscript by John McCall of the tune Captain Duncan McGregor. It's a spay, except it's titled in this one, J.A. Gordon. So he must have changed the name of it later on. And it's also written out in real time. And the note says, from John McCall, with compliments to Pipe Major William Ross, 19. 34. It must goodness. have been before the two of them fell out over the publication of John McCall's tunes in, in his books. And this is one of the most interesting ones here, Alan. And this is the original score of Doll McLeod's, Spike Major Doll McLeod's, Doll McLean's tuning phrase. Aye. The right. one that goes, he humpy, 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 humbo. Uh -huh. And what's really interesting about this is he writes an original tuning phrase and he writes a note to D.R. McLaren saying, I cannot at the moment remember the second time for the last measure. Somewhere on the top hand, but you can fit one in main time. Donald. And I have a tape upstairs <laughs> of a radio broadcast of, uh -huh. of, of D.R. McLaren and he plays a march and then he breaks and starts playing the suspend reel. And in between the two tunes, he actually plays he humpy 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 humbo <laughs> before he starts to play the suspend yeah, reel. Which is, which is quite, quite interesting. Yeah. And this one here is Roderick Campbell's The Banks of the Skier, which is a, 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 a tremendous 6 8 march. He hum ba dum bum ba dum ba dee he he a dee hum ba dum bum ba da ha dee he he a dee. Great tune. Uh, and this one is written out in, in DR's hand. It's a setting of 1906, uh, George S. McLennan's Willie Murray's Reel. Is it? Yeah. Uh, but this is not GS's handwriting, this is, this is DR's handwriting. So. Great tune, that. It's 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 a uh -huh. it's quite an interesting collection of very rare uh, tunes. And if we can go back downstairs, I'll show you one. And so on. So I've recorded a bit of that. Did you? <laughs> yes. Uh, I, I thought it was going rather well. And uh, so this is. Uh, yeah. This is. Uh, I don't believe this has seen the light of day either. It's five parts setting by G. S. McLennan, not dated, but it's initialed by him, called the Grey Buck. What we know as the Shaggy Grey Buck. Yeah. And. He's got it here, a note, make ten parts by lifting each part one note. And so, it's really very nice. Yeah. And, you know, we've got the, the, the setting of the Shaggy Grey Buck that's in, in Pipe Major Ross's books, and we've got it in Pipe Major McLeod's books. And now, uh, we'll make sure that this is published somewhere uh, by... George S. McLennan. Yeah. Fantastic. Yep. So we've got uh, two books here. We could maybe have looked at a wee bit earlier, but it's an eclectic mix we have here this morning. 
And uh, if it means backtracking uh, people, uh, just be a wee bit patient because it's uh, well worth doing. Right. This is the Peabrook book that he used. He won this Peabrook book at Loch Head Games. As you can see, it's really quite old now. I think he won it in about 1961. Uh, and he gave me this book in, I think it was 1980. Uh, he made a won an open competition at Lagarnhead Games 1960 by Major John McClellan of Seaforth Islanders and, he said, and presented it to his son Colin Roy in 1980 mm -hmm. and the great thing about the book it's got various notes in it as, as most people's Peabrook book has but in the back of it he recorded the prizes that he won at Oban and Inverness. Mm -hmm. And down here he's just penciled in 21 firsts, 5 seconds, 12 thirds, mm -hmm. 5 fourths and a fifth. And it shows exactly, of course, the first year he started competing, what he achieved, second in the marches, first in the suspension reels, third in the gold medal. Another meeting, first in the marches, first in the suspension reels, fourth in the gold medal. Mm -hmm. And so on. Uh, a couple of interesting things in 1957 he won the hornpipe competition I mm -hmm. believe that's possibly one of the only times if not the only times they had a, a, a hornpipe competition at the northern meeting and somewhere in here there's a 6-8 March competition too which I believe is the only time they had at the northern meeting which mm -hmm. he was 1949 he won mm -hmm. that as well mm -hmm. and then the probably the most interesting thing is that in 1958 he won the March to Spain Rail for former winners, the Open Peabrook, the March to Spain Rail for former winners at Inverness, and the Clasp at Inverness. For That's all in the first, same year. All in the same year. 58. And at, at the time, he's written down here an equaled record for both meetings. Mm -hmm. But in actual fact, it's an unequaled record because nobody else has done that. Who did you think that. had they... I don't know. I think he must have just assumed somebody else had done it. Mm. So he wrote in an equal record, but in fact he has the distinction of the only the only piper That's in history to have, yeah. to have done that. Mm -hmm. And it's actually quite a short career. Mm -hmm. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Thirteen visits to mm -hmm. Oban Inverness because there's quite a large gap between forty nine and fifty seven where he was posted abroad. And so that's that Peabrook book. And the other one mm -hmm is another Peabrook Society collection and in the back of that he's recorded uh, there's far too many of these things to go through but you can see where he's recorded all his prizes at the games ah this is and the, the games prizes the yes. games prizes and what he played so for instance Oban 1958 first Colin Roy McKenzie uh, March has been written, and so on. Uh, SPA Glasgow, Open Times Gold Medal, uh, and he's written down, which is really interesting, all the tunes. Uh, Inverness, Open Peerich, mm -hmm. Mistakes, and a mention. So here he went to Inverness in 57. And he got a mention, the gold medal, mistakes in a mention, March the Spoon Reel unplaced, and jigs broke down. That's probably one of the rare occasions he never <laughs> he never won a, a prize at a competition. So London 1952, he's written most of this down. And the interesting thing is you can equate all this information to uh that cabinet of medals over yes, there. Yes, absolutely. And see, yeah. and see what he what he what he played and mm -hmm. when he played it and and uh it's a great thing to record all these things because a lot of people don't and that information no, and sort it's of lost completely. Gets lost. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, he left the army and was... This was a retirement gift uh, on his retirement from the army mm -hmm. with all the crests engraved of the regiment. Uh, Queens of Hamders at the top of it, of course, and mm -hmm. all the rest of it. It says... Uh, in recognition of his outstanding service to piping while in the army. Mm -hmm. And this here 
is a silver cigarette box which says presented to Regimental Sergeant Major J. McClellan by the members of the WS and Sergeant's Met Warrant Officers and Sergeant's Mess 1st Battalion Queen's uh, Seaforth Islanders on his leaving the battalion May 1957. So, so he did uh, nice. quite a bit of soldiering apart from piping though, didn't he? Yes, he did. Yes, he did. He was the he oh, was the regimental sergeant major in in Dingwall. Yeah. Uh, between 1957 and 1959. So I mentioned earlier that was the point where he planned to actually leave the army and yeah. and and start in civilian life. Uh huh. Uh, when the appointment to the castle came along, that sort of changed everything. Mm -hmm. And and changed everything for for us. Uh, coming down to Edinburgh because both my parents are, are Highland people. Uh, they adapted to life very quickly in, in Edinburgh. Well, you had a wonderful house, I take it, in Edinburgh Castle? Well, the house that we grew up in was in a place called Ramsey Garden, which is right at the bottom of the castle esplanade. It's yeah. that rather sort of magnificent looking white building. Uh, and there was a, a very large flat came with his job. And the the army still own that that flat, but they use it as a as a hospitality centre for conferences and such like just now. But that's where my sister and I grew up. And then when he retired from the army in 1974, mm -hmm. he bought this house where we are just now uh, and retired here. Smashing house, eh? And it's a lovely place. Yeah. Okay, we'll right. just say. Having a wee look at uh, various things at the beginning of the book, what have you got here? Well, he kept this scrapbook and uh, I think my mother was the main person that, that was responsible for maintaining mm -hmm. it and, and keeping it up. Uh, and it's, it's, most of it's about my father's career, but it's about other people as well. It's mm -hmm. just a sort mm -hmm. of record of things. It says here, commenced in September 1959. There's a few things lying about. Ironically, the first one is a photograph of about an 18-year-old, uh, an eight-year-old rather, John D. Burgess. That's John when he was about eight years old. This is Gavin Stoddart at about age 15. I thought I recognised Gavin. I've seen that photograph. That's his father, George. Yeah. Right. So, Willie Ross's first retirement. I heard uh, about that. They, they gave him such a good retirement they didn't go. <laughs> he did. <laughs> <laughs> he uh, was presented a very handsome retirement gift and continued. Very smart. I uh, uh, think he was there for about another 10 years or something. I think so. Uh, this is when he first went to the castle. It's Pike Major Evan McCray. Uh, Articles on RSM McClellan wins gold medal. Photographs of different pipers. We'll just flick through. No other meeting piping. Dingwall Seaforth wins McBrain trophy. This is first of all starting talking about the educators aspect of piping. And up here, Seaforth gold medalist, Pipe Major Don McLean, Pipe Major William Taylor, Pipe Major Don McLeod, Captain D.R. McLennan, my father. Uh -huh. uh, I'll just flick through to someone. Uh, Hugh McCallum, believe it or not. Yeah, and John Hugh McFadden. Hugh had won the Open Peabrook about the age of 18 at that gathering, and John McFadden. Mm -hmm. uh, Norman Gillis, Salister's father, and amongst that Aye. TA course. Uh -huh. Here's an interesting picture of my father playing at a games somewhere. This was a tune that he composed for the King of Norway. That's that photograph over there. Mm -hmm. uh, a 
This is a newspaper article on the visit of Yehudi Menyon. Mm -hmm. Which is, that picture up there on the wall is, is Yehudi Menyon and him in the house up at the castle. This is another photograph of gold medalists at the Northern Meeting. Sadly, most of them are gone now. William MacDonald, Ian McFadden still, Hale and Hearty. Yep. Willie MacDonald, Bimbecula, John McDougall, John Burgess, Ian M. Morrison, Point Major Don McLeod, my father, Captain D. R. McLean, and Hugh C. R. McRae, who I had some lessons with actually, here in Edinburgh. Hector McFadgen, Penny Gale. Penny Gale. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. An article about him yeah. <laughs> winning the gold medal. Yeah. He had the. Somebody said he'd quite a small sort of repertoire, but played oh. better up. Yeah. This is Archie Cairns, Pike Major Archie Cairns Canada, who was a, a, a exceptionally close friend of my father's. He came across from the. Second Canadian Guards to do the Pike Majors course in the middle 1960s, and they became lifelong friends. And Archie was very much of the same mind as regards the the setting up of classes and the educative mm -hmm. aspect, and 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 did all that kind of work in in Canada. And Archie must be a very advanced age now, yeah. uh, but still still well and still playing the pipes. I understand. What relatives has Archie got? Over there. Archie's son John yes. is a double gold medalist. Yeah. That's and why I'm asking. <laughs> yes. John when Archie Archie came with his family and John and I were oh, I'd be about four or five years old. Yeah. And John and I used to play together yeah. in the house in, in Ramsey Garden. Different photographs of the of the courses. This is the typical skull of the bagpipes <laughs> comment, you know. It's a uh, star Johannesburg. Uh -huh, it's in a couple of articles from visits to South Africa. Uh, William MacDonald and Beckula winning the gold medal. John MacDonald, Glasgow Police. Pipe Major. Who is that? Is it John? John McDonald, Glasgow Police. Uh -huh. Pipe Major Dom McLeod. Pipe Major Crab and Row from the Scots Guards. Mm -hmm. Pipe Major Andrew Pickethley, who was a tremendous player, I understand. Mm -hmm. Becoming the Queen's Piper. So there's two lads from Brittany, the Alain brothers. Jean Francois won the P work at Glenfinnan one year. He was coming to the dad for lessons. Different death of William Ross. So this is a memorial service program which my father played at. Mm -hmm. uh, interesting little thing there is that his bass drone stopped in the middle of his playing. And the funny thing was that my when we scattered my father's ashes up in Inverchin, Gavin was good enough to come up, Gavin Stoddart, to, yeah. to play. And the uh -huh. strangest thing was his bass drone stopped yeah. as well. That's amazing, that. <laughs> that eh? was quite... And was that the famous bass drone read that never... No. <laughs> <laughs> that was quite a, a aye. coincidence. Aye, aye. Uh, Duncan McFadgen, John McFadgen, Different piping courses. Douglas Thorison from New Zealand, I remember mm -hmm. him. This is in Seattle. He did quite a, a bit of travelling in North America then, eh? A lot of travelling to do different summer schools and, and 
teaching courses and all that kind of thing. This is of the Horse Guards Parade mm -hmm. in London. Uh, the program of it. Uh, different photographs of Ronald McCallum, James Anderson. Where is that, sorry? This would have been down at the Horse Guards Parade. Mm -hmm. From Major Cuthbertson. I remember him a lot from watching the I tattoo. I remember Anderson, actually. That was the one that he, they called him Big Ugg. I, yeah. I remember him holding a starter by the throat who <laughs> fired a gun. It's during the march competition at Kill. Uh -huh. And the march platform was next to where the sprinter started. Uh -huh. And Big Ugg was halfway through the march. The gun went off. He broke down. Dumped his pipes, jumped off a platform, and had the start of his throat. Oh, he was a he was a giant of a man. <laughs> he was bigger he's, than Ronnie Laurie. There's a photograph of of Pipe Major Andrew Pickethley in mm -hmm. dressed as the Queen's Piper. Mm -hmm. uh, this is an interesting photograph. Uh, judging in Germany, uh, Pipe Major Ian McLeod. Mm -hmm. My father, Captain Ian C. Cameron, and a very young Ian M. Morrison with John Allen. Mm. This is in Fort Gapel, Saskatchewan. These pictures down here. This mm -hmm. is James L. McWilliams, who had a very good march named after him by Pipe Major Don McLeod. Pipe Major Angus <laughs> MacDonald. Yeah. Uh, Currying favour with somebody? Yes. <laughs> Gavin Stoddart. Yeah. Scots Guards. Jamal Zurichat was a Jordanian piper mm -hmm. on the course. Famous Piper visits Hoyk. There's, there's the Pride. Yeah. James Pride. Yeah. Jimmy yeah. Pride. Yeah. Who's this chap up here? Lance Corporal Johnston. Is that George Johnston? I don't know if it is. I think it. Is it? And this says Myth, Miss Daunt, Germany's leading pop star. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Jimmy Pride yeah. again. Yeah. yeah. Of Amazing Grace fame. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, Chapel Royal Recital. Uh, that was for the Phantom Piper of Corriarek. A letter of congratulations from Angus McPherson. Uh, getting near the end. No. <laughs> <laughs> this is in Chicago. Yeah. I paid a visit to Chicago. John Goodenow. Arthur Laurie. Jack Ironside. This was a very famous picture. Because apparently this was the first time in... Oh, I said... Got. North America. Oh, yeah. Yes. This yeah. is the first time apparently in North America that four gold medalists had stood together. This was yeah. in Maxville. John Wilson. Mm hmm My father, John McFadden. Yeah. Pipe Major Sam Scott. Yeah. And Seamus McNeil. Yeah. Nowadays, four gold medalists stand in North America yeah. at nearly every game. But yes. <laughs> that was the first... Yeah. That was yeah. the very first time. Mm hmm So that's a bit of a historic picture. I don't know who he is. Mm -hmm. Not sure. Not sure. There's an interesting photograph. Well, there's an interesting oh, one. It is. Uh, Norman Gillis, Alistair's father. Uh, this girl, Elizabeth Hutchin, is Jennifer Hutchin's sister. Nicky Gordon and 
got and stored it. This is an early newspaper article of Pipe Major William Ross. This is Pipe Major Don McLeod. And a lot of people in this picture think that's my father, but I believe that's Pipe Major William McLeod from Pine Falls, Manitoba, who was over doing a course at the castle. He was sent. Mm -hmm. This is Pipe Major Don McLeod too. And this is in... in Willie Ross's Army School of Piping. We've seen some of these photographs before. This is Ian Morrison winning mm -hmm. 1970 that was, winning the gold medal. Played the Viker at Dundee. Different photographs of parades. Of guards. This was a College of Piping photograph. Uh, Ian McClellan. This, mm -hmm. this at the mm -hmm. time was all the teachers that the college were I've actually got to say, yeah. Yeah. that's Andrew Wright. Don yeah. McPherson. I think this he was a fellow right, called sorry. Bob yeah. Swift who was uh -huh. a treasurer. Andrew mm -hmm. Wright, Duncan McFadgen, yeah. Dougal B. McNeil, who I heard playing two weeks ago. I interviewed him last and week. Very well he was playing too. Mm -hmm. Remarkable man. I'm not sure who this is. No. That's, I should know who that is. Uh, he used to follow the band, yeah. the police band. Thomas Pearson, Tom Ian McFadgen, <laughs> Kenny McLean, McLean and Angus, and Angus James. James. Yeah. Uh -huh. Lovely picture. Sam Scott oh, yeah. Yeah. was killed in a car accident yeah. man it took. Yeah. An interesting thing about Sam Scott was uh, my father and John McFadgen spent the week at his house once mm -hmm. in Ottawa and every evening they would play on Sam yeah. Scott's lawn yeah. yes. and my dad often told me that some of the finest beaver playing yeah. that he ever heard was from John McFadgen mm -hmm. during that time at Sam Scott's house. Mm -hmm. Articles about Archie Cairns. This is at a Peabrick Society conference. Jimmy Pride again. Mm -hmm. This is the recital program I was telling you about earlier where all these tunes were and then the talk, the Mackay Pipers from Rassi. Mm -hmm. All very formal and, and Mm -hmm. Different tunes that were published. Program from Queensland. Mm -hmm. Jennifer Hutchin. This is in here. Mm -hmm. This is my first ever competition. <laughs> there you go. Second prize, mm -hmm. practice chanter, age 10 years. <laughs> Mackenzie Highlanders. Yeah. Uh, Good drum prospects to drop it. here. Good prospects here. Yeah. Well. This was a Chinese piper that attended, I think he's the only Chinese piper that attended any, I think this was an advanced pipers course, and he had a very uh, complicated name, and he, they called him Paul. He was given the name Paul because nobody could pronounce his, his proper name. Uh, This is Pipe Major David Aitken, who was my father's major for quite a few years in the in the castle. There's Paul. <sighs> so actually, 16 Pipe and Times made the front pages. Pipe and Times. What date was that? 
April 1975. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. So it's around 1977. John McFadden <laughs> died. Uh, I got sadly. It. And I oh, but, uh, Mm hmm yes. Hello, uh, we're just going to wind up there folks. Uh, we've not run out of material, far from it. Uh, there's a, an attic or a den up the stairs which is full of army school of piping records. Mm -hmm. uh, probably a better title to it than that. But uh, of all the people who have gone through the courses under John McClellan and uh, more or less the tunes and the comments and all this. We haven't touched that today, but what we've done is uh, go through all the various bits of memorabilia and you've got lots of stories here, history and everything else. Quite fantastic really. I've only scratched the surface and it's almost like a museum of piping in here and uh, from the set out this journey this morning we didn't know where we were going but it certainly was a very very interesting uh, journey and thanks very much uh, Colin for your, your time and patience with us here and uh, it's very good of you to have us Piper's persuasion and I hope that the viewers here have taken uh, some education as well as some uh, entertainment from this uh, particular interview and uh, thanks again. Thank you very much Alan, it's been a complete pleasure, thank you. Okay, we might be back. <laughs> well, um, when I was a training officer at Cameron Barracks in the days of the National Service, we used to fiddle the curriculum so we got plenty of time outdoors and plenty of exercise. And then the final exercise used to be walking over the Coriaric Pass, you know, from from um, Fort Augustus over the hill to Newton Moor. Mm -hmm. Well, we didn't go all the way to Newton Moor. We stopped at, at, at a place called Garvamore, Garver, which had been an old stopping place in the days when the Fort Augustus was occupied. The farm was called still called Garvamore Barracks. Anyway, we set off this day, three pipers, Ian McFadden, uh, Ian Smart, no, uh, Jimmy Smart, mm -hmm. next boy piper, a good player, and Ian Fraser mm -hmm. from um, up um, Space Night somewhere. And we set off, it was um, at the end of March. Okay. I mean, we got down, then we got to the climb, and halfway up the hill the wind got up, and it wasn't snowing, but the snow was being driven off the drifts. You couldn't see very far in front of it, so here was I with 80 national servicemen. <laughs> in the middle of the island. <laughs> Nobody knew where we were. <laughs> Never mind, press on. So on we went, I had the, the taps holding on to the bayonet of the tap in front and that sort of thing. And I went up to the front of the column where the three pipers were. And Ian Fraser was a shepherd, he was bred to the hill. And I said, um, Are you, can you see the path, Ian? He said, no, I'm following the birds. And there were a pair of ptarmigan and the white plums walking along the path in front. Now, just before that, I'd gone to Aberdeen to judge a competition with the, the, the sheriff, Sheriff Grant of uh, Rothy Marcus. And I told him we were going to walk across the, the quarry. And he said, I wonder if you'll see the ghost army. Because there's said to be a ghost army that goes over there uh, Montrose went that way to the Battle of Inverlochy mm -hmm. and it's said to be Montrose's army and he said to me if anyone sees them David it'll be you a Highland soldier 
I thought, well, God, that was a, that was a common one. So, um, anyway, Ian was following the birds and it was visibility was numb, the wind was whistling and it was stinging our knees. Well, I always made the march on the kilt. <coughs> but on we went. And when we got to the top of the pass, the birds flew off. Mm -hmm. And we got down the other side. The pipes were soaked through. We had nine miles to march to go up a more barracks where the colour sergeant was waiting with the hot meal and the tea and all the comforts. <coughs> so we got there and everything was ready. See? Uh -huh. So I said, oh, well done. So, oh, they said, we heard the pipes. Uh -huh. I said, what? They said, we heard the pipes. We heard you coming down the glen. We heard the pipes. And I said, but we didn't, no playing the pipes. <laughs> The colour sergeant was an, an old piper, an ex-piper, had been there ten years in the pipe band, and said, we heard the pipe, sir, you know me, I, I was a piper and all this sort of thing, and the boys said, the cooks all said, yes, we heard the pipe, sir. And it was getting dark, and the wind was whistling and down and howling, uh -huh. <laughs> and I thought, let's get the hell out of here. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so we got off our marks, Aye. and so, so we told the story.